My name is Caitlin Tripp. I teach world history and AP world history at North Atlanta High School, where I'm also the social studies department chair. And today I'm going to be walking you through some of my favorite features of Google Classroom and some best practices that I think will help you as you implement Google Classroom in your own practice. So with that said, let's get started. Um, what you're looking at right now on the screen are all of my current Google Classrooms, which is a significant number of AP and all-level Google Classrooms. I wanted to note here that Google Classrooms are not just good for your interactions with students. They are incredible and powerful for your interactions with peers, and that can happen in a couple of different ways. So for example, um, I've got access to information regarding our gifted and talented program from one of my colleagues. Our faculty and staff has a Google Classroom where they roll out information to us. So this is not just something that you know, I use with students. Additionally, this is something that I use with colleagues in my professional learning community or my PLC. So one of the things that you'll note here is that while I have my own Google Classrooms, I am also a member of other teachers' Google Classrooms and we can share resources with one another. I have made other teachers, teachers in my Google Classrooms um, for years and this way I can see what they're posting, they can see what I'm posting, and we can share resources with one another seamlessly. So just a few thoughts for you about the overall use of Google Classroom and how it can be used, not just for students, but also for better collaboration with peers and your school colleagues. So that said, uh, when I'm setting up a Google Classroom, and I won't go through the process today of how to set one up, I'm assuming that many of you watching this are familiar Side note, of course, that it is very user-friendly. All you can do to set up a Google Classroom is go up to this plus in the upper right-hand corner. And when you do that, it asks you to create or join a class. When you create one, it will walk you through the process with writing in the name of the class, etc. But let's go into one of my classes. This is my on-level world history class. I've clearly customized it with a header that I designed for the course. And one thing that I think a lot of people miss out on is the opportunity to put additional information right here at the top. And so just to note how I did that, if you go into your class settings under class details, where it says section, you can put any information that you want. And that's what I put here, codes, when my tutorial is, any other information that I want to make sure is very, very clearly visible to students. Um, so. Just a side note about how to use that feature. The other thing that I think really makes your Google Classroom powerful is the creation of topics. So clearly I have made three topics already this year. If we look at some of my older classes, um, and I do keep them from previous years, I'll talk about that in just a moment. If you look at older classes, you can see that I wind up having lots of different sections, lots of different topics. So if we look at all topics here, you can see that I do it by unit. But beyond doing it by units or time periods, I teach social studies, of course, you can see that I have a section just for summative assessments. So all of my test resources go here. I have a section for extra credit. When preparing for the AP exam, I have a section just for our boot camp where we do work together. I've got a section for review materials and just general materials. Yours will obviously look specific and unique to you. Um, but making them fun and making them visually accessible to students, I think, is really helpful. So obviously, I've inserted here uh, a variety of emojis and things to make it very clear what each of these time periods is related to. Going back to this idea of having these saved classes from previous years, one of the beautiful things about Google Classroom is that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So every year, I archive my old classes, but I save one of them. To archive a class, if you go back to your home, you'll see that there are three buttons. And if I wanted to archive this, I would click on those three buttons and I would click on then this option down here, archive. My archive keeps all of my old classes for me. And um, it's a really great way of filing away your courses. So they, they still exist. You're just not going to be looking at them all of the time. What I do is I archive all but one of a particular course. So this was my 2324 World History. I kept this version and then I simply removed all of the students. So I still have access to it and my colleagues still have access to it. So if we want to go back and say, okay, well, what did I do last year? I just finished actually 
a PLC meeting with a colleague or a group of colleagues. And we walked through and said, well, what did you do last year for the topic of Zoroastrianism? And I was able to go in and say, oh, this is what I did. And all of my files were right here waiting for me. This also means that first thing in the morning, if I am running uh, behind, I can easily reuse materials from a previous year and simply make a few adjustments. So I'll show you how I do that. I go back to the class that I want to post in. I go up to create and I click down here to reuse post. Now I've automatically selected here uh, this class because it's one I've been reusing from, but uh, traditionally, if you go to reuse post, it shows you all of the classes you can post from, including a whole bunch of old archived classes. I'm going to click, click on this course right here from last year. And then all of my posts, materials, and questions will populate for me. And I simply have to scroll down and I find the post that I want to reuse. Since I'm going all the way back to August of last year, it takes me just a moment, but here we are. I want to reuse this warm-up question. I select it, I click reuse, and the post is right here waiting for me. I can decide who I want to assign it to, whether I want it graded, do all of my students need to access this prompt, and when I want it to be due. I want it to be due the day that they have that class with me, which will be on Thursday. No, it will be on Wednesday. And if I want to set a time, I can do that as well. I can also set the topic. And it is automatically selected unit one for me from last year. And that's great because it's going to be in unit one this year too. For questions, I can decide if students can reply to one another or if they can edit their answer. For this purpose, I'm going to keep their responses private so that they can do their reflection without worrying about other students seeing their responses. Now. I don't want to ask this just yet. This is going to be for tomorrow morning's warm up. So instead of clicking ask, I'll go to this little arrow and just save draft. The other option I have is to schedule. If I save draft, it just waits in Google Classroom for me until I'm ready to post it. But given that I know I'm teaching this class at 8.15 or 8.30 tomorrow morning, I'm going to go ahead and schedule it. So I'm going to schedule it for August 7th, and I'm going to schedule this to post at 8.30 a.m. so that the minute students walk into my class and class starts, this post will post for them and will be ready to go. And you can see it's grayed out right now because it is not yet ready to post, but it's waiting for us. One of the other things that I can do is if I want to create and reuse a post, I don't have to just go to my classes. If my colleague has done a great job on something, I can use hers. So because this colleague has given me access as a teacher to her class, I can click on this and I can go to her resources and reuse one of her resources and post it. This is really important as we talk about collaboration in our PLCs, making sure that you are a co-teacher for your fellow um, PLC members is one of the best practices that I've put in place in my PLC, done this for years. And it's one of the best practices that I use as a department chair as well, making sure that I can access resources and that I can provide resources for others. It's not just about being able to go in and take resources from her class. It's also about being able to provide resources to her class as well. Some of my favorite things about Google Classroom have to do with how students interact with it. So if we look at a lesson, and let's go to a lesson from last year, as it's early enough in the year that this classroom does not have a lot of materials in it. If we look at a lesson from last year, you can see that students are able to interact with the resources in a lot of different ways. So for this lesson on ancient Egypt, for example, if we view the instructions, I always make sure that my standard is very much at the top in the title, as well as the topic. I make sure that the last year we were using uh, this style of putting our student objective up. This year we are using I can statements, so they look a little different. But I always put my I can statement at the top, and then I let students know what we're going to be learning and what we're going to be doing. 
I put instructions here, rubrics, etc. You can link all of your videos, your notes, your resources right here for students. This means that if they miss a day for one reason or another, they can always come back and they know what they missed on that date, what the topic was, and they have a very clear set of marching orders regarding what they need to do to catch up on their assignment. You can also put other resources in your Google Classroom that allow students to communicate with you. For example, at the very top under materials, my students have access to a late work form. This late work form in the instructions I make sure it's very clear to them what our missing work policy is and how they can complete this form to let me know about their late work and greet it. One of the other things that I do that I think is a best practice with Google Classroom is I allow students to submit work in the way that works best for them. And in this way, you can personalize learning for all of your students. So for example, looking here at this lesson I recently posted for my AP students on civilizations and river valleys. I gave them our um, objective at the top, our marching orders for the day, some homework videos, and I noted here for them that they needed to watch these videos and come up with a one paragraph summary prepared for each video. This will allow us to have front loaded their learning and dive into our next lesson. I made a note for them saying that they can do this by hand or in the attached document. The attached document is one that they can edit themselves. I don't prescribe how they do that, but they could also, if they wanted to, attach pictures of their work. I'm not prescribing how they achieve the goal so long as they do achieve the goal. All of my assignments are designed this way, where students can do them physically or digitally if whichever one works for them. So another example of students having access to diversity can be seen in a lesson that I'm prepping for um, next week. So I'm, can go, I'm going to go back to my classroom from last year, and I'm going to show you what that assignment looked like. It was from unit one, and it was our lesson on monotheism in the ancient world. For this lesson, students were told to do a one-pager. I've given them a lot of different resources in Google Classroom, links, videos, PowerPoints, but the actual assignment linked right there for them says that they can do this on paper, on printer paper, construction paper. Um, they can do this as a Google Doc, a Google Slide, a Canva poster, if they want to do it digitally. I've simply said it must be one page, and this is the information that their one pager needs to include. So students get to choose the religion they want to look at, Zoroastrianism or Judaism, they get to choose how they want to present their learning, and they get to choose, um, you know, exactly what images and content they want to include within the structure that I've provided them. Students will then go into this lesson, and they'll simply upload when they go to submit. They'll either upload their digital, um, digital file that they've created or a picture of the work that they've designed, and they'll upload them to this learning platform. So this is kind of a wide open way for them to engage. Students have also used Google Classroom to upload videos of themselves. I have a lesson that I do on European explorers where students can choose if they want to design, I mean, a board game. They can design any number of things. Um, students have baked cakes, they've choreographed dances, they have composed music, um, the sky's the limit. But students are able to upload digital files of whatever it is that they have designed or created. So I've received videos, short films, claymation, images of, of art that they've created. And of course, a lot of those things, those items come into the classroom as well. So I'll have model shit. Um, of, a, of a particular explorer in the classroom, but they can provide evidence of their creativity in Google Classroom by uploading a digital file as well. The last thing I want to mention about Google Classroom that makes your life easier is the way that it integrates so seamlessly. So Google Classroom has a lot of different platforms that it works well with. Google Classroom um, obviously is aligned with all of your Google tools, so Google Forms, Google Sheets, etc. So 
I have access in, or I have uh, pay, placed in Google Classroom for students a variety of resources that we work through over the course of the year, including reading quizzes. So if you look at one of our reading quizzes, I've simply put a form in here for students. We go to view instructions. This form is the only form that's attached to this assignment. And this form is where students will put their answers. If we go to student work, because this is the only form and the only file attached to this assignment, I can simply import their grades. So this saves me a lot of time having to individually go in and get student grades. Obviously, if it was a lot of questions that weren't multiple choice, that were short answer questions, I'd have to grade those individually. But let's say that was the case. Because Google Forms is right here for me, if I needed to go in to the responses, grade these responses individually for myself, and then save all those grades, when I go here and click import, my work is still going to be shortened because those grades are going to seamlessly transport over from the form to this area right here for me to put into Infinite Campus or whatever other platform I'm using for grades. So this can save you a lot of time. But again, just remember that you can only do that time-saving trick if this is the only item that's attached to the assignment. If I attach any other items like a PDF or something of that nature, it will not be able to automatically import my items for me. So just keep that in mind. Google Classroom has seamless integration with a variety of other programs. If you watched our video, our APS video on Brisk, you know that Brisk is a beautiful tool and Brisk teaching integrates with all things um, Google Docs, Google Slides, Google Forms. So you can absolutely integrate all of your favorite tools that you already use with Google Classroom. If you are a Magic School fan, Magic School also will integrate beautifully with Google Classroom as Magic School will import and um, create for you a variety of Google products like Google Forms, Google Slides, things like that. I hope you have so much fun with Google Classroom and I hope it revolutionizes the way that you engage with your community.